And I think we already started streaming, so welcome all. And uh, I should mute myself. Yes, so perfect. Right, so let's do this again because hearing myself a couple of seconds. Uh, anyways, um, welcome all. So we already have a whopping nine people online here, so this is fine. Should grow in a couple of seconds here. And... Um, yeah, so with me is Martin. Hi, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. Hey, everyone. Splendid, splendid. So you already put your 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 master slide on. Uh, so today is all about API visibility in Kotlin. Before we start, um, as always, please don't hesitate to put any questions into the chat. I will happily collect it and will relay them to you, Martin, uh, once I'm... Not, not, not me, but you finished. Okay, <laughs> my day today. Uh, once you finish the talk, and um, yeah, so let's have all some fun with your talk. And the stage is yours. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, let's jump into it then. Uh, hey everyone, uh, my name is Martin Brown. I'm a GD for Kotlin and Android, and I work as an Android developer advocate for Stream, uh, where we create uh, chat SDKs for all sorts of platforms, including, of course, for Android, which is what I do. Uh, today, I get to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is mastering API visibility in Kotlin, all about how to control the visibility of different things in your Kotlin code. I want to start by defining what an API surface is. Um, so let's say that you're building either a library or just one of your modules in a multi-module app. Uh, either way, you're going to have a module that you're working with. In there, you're going to have things like classes, and inside those classes, you're going to have members, um, so functions and properties and so on. And for each of these classes, you get to decide whether or not you want to expose them to the external world, whether you want your clients to be able to access them. Um, so you can kind of pick classes and you can push them to the boundary of your module, uh, therefore making them visible to the outside world. And you can make this decision for each class and then you can make similar decisions for each member inside those classes. So function by function, you can decide whether you want it to be exposed to the outside world or you want it to be hidden within the module as a private detail. And all the things that you push to the very edge of your module that is going to be exposed is your API surface. You can think of this as being the attack surface for your clients. Um, you have to be quite defensive about building APIs. Um, you have to assume that people are not going to be smart about using them. Um, so um, yeah, just think of this as the attack surface. That's a good analogy. OK, um, I'm going to take this representation now and transform it into the simpler one. So here we still have the module, and we have declarations in it that are either private, which is green, or exposed, which is orange on the chart. And these things, of course, can depend on each other. And they can, um, like public pieces of your library can depend on other public API, and uh, private things uh, can depend on each other as well. And then you're going to have your clients who also have some classes, some sort of code in their application. And whenever they call into your library, they're going to start depending on pieces of your public API. The first concept I want to get uh, through here is that a minimal public API is a very good idea. So if you uh, have read the good book, uh, by which I mean effective Java, uh, then you're going to know that item 15 in there is to minimize the accessibility of classes and members. Um, this is actually the very first item in chapter four, which is called classes and interfaces. And there are a lot of other items in there, but apparently this is one of the most important things that you should do when you are designing object-oriented code. And it also applies if you're not so object-oriented, if you're more functional, if you have more top-level things in Kotlin, um, the same advice applies the exact same way. So for one, uh, there's an effective Java item about this, and it explains in great, great detail why a minimal API is a good idea. But let me uh, show you just a couple simple reasons. So first off, a minimal API is much easier to maintain and change in the future. Um, if you have a library and you have clients, then they're going to depend on your public API. But your private API can freely change at any time. So if you have private uh, things in your library that are not exposed, you can freely change them around. You can add new things. You can remove things. 
And all of this can be done without breaking anything in your client code. On the other hand, if you were to remove something that's public API that clients were depending on, they're now gonna get compilation errors or runtime errors in worst cases. So you have to be really careful about doing that. What about removing public API that nobody is using? Let's say that there's this piece of uh, public um, code in your library and you're assuming that no one is calling that. As far as you know, no one's using that function, for example. Uh, well, that's mostly an illusion. Uh, if you ever make anything public, even for just one version of your library, you basically have to assume that someone already immediately starts using it and they're depending on it. So removing it would be a breaking change. Let's take a look at how Kotlin helps you remove things uh, with its uh, deprecation uh, options. Uh, I'm gonna show you an example from one of my open source libraries, Crate here, uh, which is a library to easily access shared preferences values with nice APIs using Kotlin's delegates. So here I have a function that was taking two parameters, a string and a lambda. And I wanted my clients to migrate to a new API where they call two separate functions where they pass in these two parameters separately. Uh, to do this, I can annotate this declaration with the deprecated annotation from Kotlin, which allows me to specify a message and the level that I want this deprecation to have. Uh, by default, this is warning. And in the message, I can just use freeform text to describe uh, what they should do instead of using this function. I can also do something more advanced, which is a replace with a parameter for the deprecated annotation. In this parameter, I can specify a string that contains some sort of code uh, which describes what the current function's usages should be replaced with. And if someone is using this old function, they'll now get an intention action in the IDE to replace it with the new code. And if you make this nice enough, if uh, you make this string something that the IDE can interpret, which there are no like hard documented rules for, you just kind of have to write uh, correct code in there and hope that the IDE gets it. Um, I advise that you just test whether it works correctly and migrates the old code to the new one correctly uh, every time that you do this. Um, so you get these intention actions, uh, which do automatic migrations to the new syntax, which is really useful. And you might need additional imports to do this. So there's also an additional parameter here where you can specify an array of imports that you want to add. Then you can raise the deprecation level. You usually do this over time. You start with a warning initially uh, to warn people that you're gonna remove that declaration, that you want to kill that API. Then you can raise it to an error, in which case code that calls that declaration will no longer compile. You'll st still show the same error message and you'll still have this migration path with the intention action to the new API. Uh, this can still be suppressed, but it's difficult to do. So most clients at this point will uh, actually do the migration. And then you can go a step further. You can use the hidden deprecation level, uh, which if you apply it, uh, will now just completely hide this function from clients. So if they still have references to it in their code, it's gonna show up as an unresolved uh, name. And the reason why you would do this instead of just straight up removing the declaration is binary compatibility. So if some clients already have compiled code that's referring to this function, if it's hidden, they can still run that code and it won't have, uh, it won't crash at runtime. It will still call into this old function and work as expected, but no source code, as you can see here, will be able, able to reference your function. I wrote a bunch about source and binary compatibility and how this also applies in Android libraries, uh, as well as deprecations, which I just mentioned a couple of years ago. So I'll have this blog post at the very end of the talk in the resources for you to check out. Another good reason for minimal APIs is that they are easier to learn. Uh, think of it, if you had a library where everything was public that was in the library, then you would have a harder time getting started with it as you would have to figure out which classes you're supposed to create instances of, which methods you're supposed to call on them. And compared to this, if you get a library where there are only a couple public classes and only a couple dozen public methods, then it gets very, very easy to learn how to use the library. You can't really go wrong with it. Uh, you'll see what you can create instances of, and you'll see um, like just by auto-completion, you can just discover what's available in the library, what functionality it has. And on the flip side of this, a library like this is also harder to misuse, which is great. 
Uh, again, as a library author, you have to assume that users are not going to know how to correctly use your library. So if you make it hard to misuse, then you're going to have a better time as well. So how do you get to this magical place where your API is minimal and obvious and uh, well-designed? Well, it's really all about the design. It's all about the planning. And ideally, you have to start with this when you're creating a library or a module that is going to be used by a lot of other modules. Again, this can happen just within a single application as well. Um, so you would start by designing the interface first. You would design those classes, those functions, those models that are going to be referenced by, by clients. You're going to figure out what client code is going to look like that's calling into your library. And only after you've done that and you've evaluated the different options you have, only then do you go and actually implement the functionality that's going to be behind those APIs. Okay, with the theory out of the way, let's get to the actual Kotlin code and talk about what you can do in Kotlin to achieve a minimal API. So by default, everything in Kotlin is public. Uh, this is how visibility uh, works in the language. And on the other end of the spectrum is the private modifier, which restricts the visibility of a declaration to the current file or within the current class. And in between these two, there's a very, very handy keyword, a very handy visibility level called internal which restricts the visibility of something to the current module. If you're using Gradle, which you're probably doing, that's the current Gradle module. And you probably want to use this a lot when you're building a library, uh, because this way you can share code within your module and freely call into anything. But your clients won't be able to access the declarations that you've created as internal. Let's take a look at a few useful examples. For example, let's say that you have some kind of interface like this service here that your clients are supposed to use. And you're going to create instances of this within your library somewhere. And you're going to have some class that actually implements the interface. In cases like this, it's very handy to make these implementation classes internal. That way, it's not difficult for you to create and reference them. So within your library, you, you are not uh, bound to only create instances of this class within the same file or anything like that. But your clients won't get uh, to uh, create these instances, they'll only ever see the interface that you provide. Similarly, you can split up just a single class uh, between public and internal API as well. Uh, take this client, for example, which has some kind of connection state, uh, depending on what methods are called on it. This state will change over time, so it's declared as a mutable var property. But we don't want our clients to be able to change it. This is supposed to be read-only for clients. And again, internal can be used to achieve this. Uh, you just have to explicitly type out the set keyword after the property. This way, you're still getting the auto-generated setter, which is just going to assign the value to the field. But you can now put a visibility modifier on it. And in this example, we're just making the setter internal, which means that to the outside world, even though this is a var, it's going to look like a read-only val instead when they are using the network client class. Other things that you'll want to make internal are common utility functions, especially if they're extensions on very basic types. Let's say that you do a lot of string formatting in your SDK. In that case, you might define extensions like this one. And if you were to make this public, it would show up in auto-completion for all of your clients' code when they're working with strings, which is probably not something that you want. Similarly, if you have very general functions, uh, very broadly applicable functions, you might not want to expose those from your library. Let's say that you're an image loading library and you need to calculate some pixels. You need to average some values somewhere uh, within your library. That code, uh, if it looks like a function like this, should probably be internal. Because if you make it public, your clients might accidentally start using it for completely other things. Uh, Maybe they'll uh, start doing financial calculations using your average functions because they just thought that this was a um, standard library function or something basic in Kotlin. They weren't looking at where they were importing it from and so on. So be very cautious about providing functionality accidentally that your library is not supposed to cover and prefer to make these things internal instead. Then uh, let's have a word about testing and the internal uh, visibility. If you have some state in your code and you want to make assertions on that during testing, you want to check that at a certain point in time, it's in a, it has a certain value in it, uh, you won't be able to do that if that state is private. So 
Again, the internal visibility modifier is really handy here um, because different source sets, like the test source set, can also access things within the same module if it's internal. So if you have some internal state in your production code, then your tests in the same module will be able to access it. But again, clients uh, will not. If you're working on Android, you can make this even more explicit. There's this visible for testing annotation you can use, uh, which can uh, clarify that this is only open uh, to the internal visibility instead of uh, being private um, for the sake of testing. And it's not supposed to be used from elsewhere otherwise. Let's also consider Java interrupt, which is something you should always do when you're using uh, Kotlin features. Um, so for example, we can have a repository class in Kotlin and give it an internal function uh, so that it's not available in other modules. Uh, the bad news here is that if someone's writing Java code in your client module, then they're actually gonna be able to access this. Um, the syntax for this would look something like this. They could create an instance of the repository class and they could call the method that's inside that. Now the method name will be uh, slightly mixed up. Uh, it gets these uh, like post fixes. Uh, which is the name of the library that it's compiled in. If you're an Android, it also gets the build variant uh, in this uh, postfix. But the point is that it will technically be possible to call these methods because at the Java bytecode level, the internal visibility doesn't exist. Um, so anything you declare in Kotlin as internal is actually public in the bytecode. And it's the Kotlin compiler that enforces internal visibility based on some metadata in the bytecode files. So what can you do about this? Uh, what can you do about Java clients who can still call your internal things from other modules? Well, one thing you can do is you can control what the name of these declarations uh, ends up being in the bytecode by using the JMVM name annotation. In this case, you can try to make the method name so something that's scary to clients, uh, but it's like clearly not a great way to go about things. Uh, another approach you can take instead is using the JVM synthetic annotation. Uh, placing this annotation on the function means that it will also be marked as synthetic in the bytecode. And the thing that synthetic declarations do in the bytecode is that source code is not allowed to reference them. So these are supposed to be used for generated things that are going to have uh, references elsewhere in the bytecode, um, but they can't be called from source code. So whenever Java clients try to call the create, ent create entity function now, they'll get an error saying that it just plainly doesn't exist. However, Kotlin clients can still call it as long as they respect the boundaries of the internal visibility modifier. The downside to this is that no Java code is gonna be able to access this function. So if you're using Java code within your own module, it will also be hidden from that code. But at this point, you're probably just writing Kotlin code in your own modules. Okay, um, moving on to the next large topic in the talk, uh, let's talk about explicit API mode. This is something that you can do in your Kotlin projects to help you think more about visibility and not make accidental choices about the visibility of your components. So this mode enforces two things. First, it requires that you have explicit visibility modifiers on all of your declarations. This means that even if something is public, which would be the case by default, you have to explicitly say that it's gonna be public. So you can't create anything that doesn't have a visibility modifier in front of it. The other thing it requires is that you add explicit type for all of your public declarations. We'll take a look at why this is useful a bit later. Let's first see how we can configure explicit API mode. The easy way to do it is to open the Kotlin block in your build configuration and just call the explicit API function in there. Uh, this will enable explicit API mode for your current module. You can do the exact same thing in a lot more complicated way, which looks like this. Uh, this is Gradle configuration that takes all of your Kotlin compilation tasks and adds compiler options and array of compiler options uh, to those tasks. So as you can see here, to enable explicit API mode with compiler flags, you have to set the explicit API flag value to strict. And this might seem overly complicated compared to the first option, but once you've done this, you can also easily add other compiler options. For example, if you're in a library, it's a good idea to add the progressive flag, which enables the progressive mode of the Kotlin compiler, uh, which means that as the language is changing and you're supposed to add new things, uh, the compiler will push you a bit sooner to make those changes and adopt your code to the um, newest Kotlin versions. 
You can also set uh, the explicit API mode uh, to a warning level. So you can both do, do this in both kinds of configuration. You can either call explicit API warning, or if you're setting the flag, you can set the value of the flag to warning. Um, this is useful because by default, uh, the explicit API mode uh, validation will give you compilation errors if you fail one of the requirements. And this way you can relax those into just compile time warnings. Let's see what uh, explicit API mode does in code. Uh, here's a simple class and it doesn't have any visibility modifiers. So let's say that I turn explicit API mode on for this file. Uh, I'll suddenly get a lot of warnings in here um, or a lot of errors rather uh, because I'm missing my uh, explicit visibility modifiers. So in this case, I would have to say that yes, my class is supposed to be public. Uh, I would also have to make the same choice for all of my properties and these constructor parameters. So I would also have to say that those are supposed to be public. And then I could go through all of my methods and also make these choices. So the say hi function, for example, uh, looks good. Let's say that that's supposed to be public. Uh, this reset method, on the other hand, kind of looks like something left over from debugging. So I probably don't want to expose this as API. So this uh, point is a uh, this is a good point to review that and just hide it from clients by, for example, making it internal. Let's take a look at the other requirement that explicit API mode imposes, which is that you have to have explicit types on anything that's public. Um, in this example, we have an interface called client factory. It has a single function that um, classes that implement the interface have to uh, implement, which is called client. And this has a default implementation which just uh, returns this default client properties value. Uh, the return type of this client method is being inferred. So the return type is client because we have an instance of the client class uh, stored in the default client variable, but this is not made explicit in the code. This is just being uh, inferred through type inference in Kotlin. So explicit API mode would give us an error here. Um, why is it better to have an explicit type here? Uh, well, because if you don't do explicit typing, you might make a change like this in your code. You might change the default client's value to something else. For example, to an offline client, which uh, we can imagine to be a more specific kind of client. And if you do this, uh, you would now have accidentally changed the return type of the client function. So if anyone has already implemented this interface, their code would likely be broken. Um, so. Also, this is very hard to notice if you don't have other implementations of this interface because you're not seeing any line changes in the interface itself. You're just seeing line changes somewhere else in your code that's affecting the return type of the interface. So for this reason, explicit API mode forces you to have types on everything that's public. In this case, it would force you to state that this function is supposed to return a client. All right, so that's explicit API mode. It has these two rules that you have to comply with if you enable it in your module. And there are two very noteworthy things about it. One of them is that it's configured per module. So if you have a large project with a lot of modules, you can decide for each of them whether you want to enable explicit API mode or not. And you don't have to migrate all of your code to explicit API mode at once. Uh, you can migrate it module by module. You can do this on separate pull requests and so on. Um, so you can improve your code over time and it doesn't have to be a lot of upfront work all at once. Similarly, you can choose between the strict and the warning levels. So if you have modules, for example, that are so large that you don't want to migrate it in one go, you can just enable it as a warning in that module. And then you can migrate it piece by piece, cleaning up that warnings while the code is still usable because it still compiles. The next thing I want to look at is published API. And this is going to have to do with inline functions. And for this example, we're going to use these two functions here. We have a song function that is public and inlined, and another in internal function which contains the actual implementation. If we were to write some client code in another module, we could, of course, call the song function because it's public. But we would have a problem here, which is that our library code on the bottom of the slide would not actually compile. Uh, we would get an error like this, which says that we're using, uh, we're using a non-public API inside a public inline function. And for some reason, the compiler doesn't allow this. If you think about how inline functions work, this actually makes sense. So whenever you, uh, someone calls an inline function, uh, when that code is compiled, uh, the calling code, 
uh, so in this case, the module that you can see on the top, then uh, the call to the song function, the inline function is gonna be replaced by the body of that function. In this case, this would mean that when the client code function is compiled, it would actually end up referencing secret function directly. Uh, that's what your clients would have at the bytecode level after they compile their code. And this would of course break the module boundaries. Uh, we have an internal function and we have a client in another module who's ref uh, referring to that internal function, which doesn't make sense because uh, from here, it would mean that you have an internal function that you're not allowed to change, to rename, to remove, uh, because you could break client code. So if you want to allow this anyway, uh, you can do an overwrite here, which is where published API comes in. This is an annotation that you can put on otherwise internal functions. And if you do this, the song function will now be valid. So even though this function is internal, it can now be inlined into client bytecode and clients might have references to it in their compiled code. However, it still won't be accessible directly. So clients can only call the public function still and not the private one. But from this point, you would eff effectively have to treat the internal secret function function as part of your public API, because again, making changes to it would break binary compatibility. Uh, and just once more, I have an article that details more about binary and source compatibility, which I'll link at the end of the talk. Okay, uh, let's move on to our next topic, which is opt-in APIs. Let's say that we are back to this scenario where we have a library, it has some private and some public API, and we have a client who's relying on this library. We might decide that we want to expand the functionality of this library, but we want to do this in a separate module because not all of our clients are going to need that extra functionality. So we have that core module that we had to begin with. And now we want to create an add-on module that does extra things on top of the original functionality. Clients would import this uh, as a dependency the same way as they're importing the core module and would be able to depend again on public things in the add-on module. And to implement the add-on module, we could also act as if we were clients of the core module. So we could take public pieces of the core modules API and call into them like this. There might be cases though, where you have things that are private in the core module because you don't want clients to be using it that you would like to use in your own like additional modules that are part of the same library group. So you might have dependencies you want like this where you want a piece of your add-on module to depend on some private API in the core module, which of course wouldn't be possible because again, you're acting as if you were a client to your own code. So a good way to, uh, to solve for this is by using opt-in APIs. Let's see how we can do that. So first in the core module, we would have to declare a new annotation that we're gonna use to mark pieces of API that are only supposed to be for internal use and clients shouldn't be building on it. Uh, so, uh, declaring an annotation in Kotlin is quite easy. You just create a new class like this. And if you want to make this uh, available for use as an opt-in API marker, you have to annotate it with requires opt-in. This looks very similar to the deprecated annotation. You can set a level here, for example, the error level uh, so that anyone using these things uh, would get a compilation error on, on them. And you can also specify a message that explains why uh, you're using this marker annotation. Of course, you have different levels here, so you could relax this to a warning, but again, for this specific use case, we're gonna stick with an error. Then to be able to do this in your core module, you again have to go to your Gradle configuration and we're gonna see something very similar here. We need to add some compiler flags. So if you're already using explicit API mode, then you already have all of this configured and you just have to add a single line in the middle. Uh, you actually have to opt into using Kotlin's opt-in APIs. Uh, so by default, it requires opt-in annotation. If you write it down within your code, it would give you some warnings. And by opting into using opt-in, uh, you could make those warnings go away. Uh, this is, uh, required because this opt-in feature is not yet stable. Uh, it's an active thing that uh, the Kotlin team is working on and it's supposed to uh, be one of the priorities. Uh, if you look at the Utrek issue for it, it's supposed to be in Kotlin 1.6. So we'll probably get this as a stable feature in, one point, uh, in like six months uh, when that comes out. And until then we have to keep doing this extra configuration. 
Once we've done that though, uh, we can now create pieces of our API that we make public because we want other modules to be able to reference it. But then we annotate with this, uh, for example, internal my library API annotation, uh, which signals to clients that they shouldn't be calling this function even though it's technically public. Going back then, once we have this set up in the core module, we want to start calling it in the add-on module. So we have that core API, it's annotated with a scary annotation. And if we try calling that in another module, we're gonna experience what clients would also see. We're gonna get an error because we're not supposed to be using this function. There are a couple different ways of making this error go away. One of them is to propagate, propagate the opt-in requirement. Uh, which would look something like this. Uh, we could also annotate our own function with the same opt-in annotation. And whoever is using this function would have to somehow opt into using it or again, propagate it further. And uh, this is not what we would want to do in our add-on module. Uh, instead, we want to actually opt into it to make all of the warnings go away because we know that uh, it's okay that we're using this. We can do this either globally for the entire module, or we can do it just locally. If we want to make this global, then unsurprisingly, we again have to go to compiler flags into module settings, and we have to use the opt-in compiler flag. This time, instead of the uh, requires opt-in annotation, specifying the full name of our own custom annotation. So adding this Gradle config means that within this module, which is the add-on module, uh, we know that it's okay to use anything that's annotated with internal my library API that would otherwise produce errors or warnings. If you don't want to do that, if you don't want to opt in for the entire module, you can opt in locally uh, like this. Uh, you can say that you want to opt into using this annotation. This makes the warnings or errors go away. Of course, again, you're using the opt-in APIs, which means that in this case, you also need some Gradle configuration because you have to opt into using opt-in. Again, this is going to go away very soon. Um, once you've done this, though, um, you can choose what level you want to opt in at. Right now, we're only making it um, making uh, our code opt in for that single function call, but we can move this annotation to the method level or the class level or even the file level if we want. So we have fine grained control over where we say that it's okay to use things that are annotated as internal API. Of course, there is still the problem of Java code. And as you would expect, because anything that's declared with uh, these annotations is otherwise public, Java code would be free to call into it uh, because, um, because it doesn't respect the constraints of these Kotlin opt-in mechanisms. Uh, these are all enforced by the Kotlin compiler, just like internal visibility is. So if you want to make sure that Java code is not misbehaving, you can just mark these things as JVM synthetic, which effectively hides it from Java clients. What I've shown you here is one specific usage of opt-in uh, annotations, which is to mark internal APIs. If we look at something like the first party Kotlin Xcoroutines uh, library, we'll see that they have a bunch of different opt-in uh, annotations that they use. So they do have this internal API annotation, which again is something that you're not supposed to use it's only for sharing code between different modules of the Kotlin X libraries. Uh, then they have an annotation called the Delicate Coroutines API. Uh, this is uh, for declarations that are supposed to be used by clients, but only in very, very specific use cases. In the um, example of coroutines, this would be global scope, for example, um, which you can technically use, but you should really reconsider it. Um, so by adding this kind of delicate annotation on it, you can produce some warnings for your clients that they have to suppress um, so that they um, express their intent to actually use it. And they say, with this, they can say that, yes, they've read the documentation and this is okay. Uh, then there are some other annotations here. Uh, there's experimental coroutines API, which is uh, quite uh, obvious. So these are pieces of API that are not finalized yet. So it's kind of risky to use them because they might change in the future. Again, uh, this is something you can do for your own libraries as well. You can create these experimental annotations, mark some things in your library, and then clients who call these functions will have some warnings on or errors on them um, so that they know that it's not completely safe to use. And in the coroutines library, there's also obsolete coroutines API. 
which sounds a lot like deprecations, uh, but they're using this to mark things that are not deprecated yet because they don't have a replacement, but are obsolete because they're just bad API that people shouldn't be using. Let's take a short break to talk about Android here. Uh, Android actually introduced its own annotations recently, both requires opt-in and opt-in as annotations. Uh, these are in the Android X annotation packages. And these are enforced by lint rules, which means that you can use these both in Kotlin and Java, which is uh, more powerful than the Kotlin provided options because you can only use those in Kotlin code and Java code is just um, completely ignoring them. So if you're on Android, you might want to use these instead. And you might think that these are in the regular Android X annotation dependency, but they're actually in a separate artifact called annotation experimental. Um, so you're going to have to pull that into your project if you want to try these. Also, there are some small bugs uh, in this Android-based implementation, but I'm being told that it should have a new release on the 30th of this month, so it should be fixed up by them. Finally, let's talk a bit about validating API. So let's say that you've designed your API and you've minimized it and you've set just everything just right. Uh, in terms of visibility. Uh, one thing you might want to do is make sure that you keep track of your API as you're creating new versions of your library, you're adding things, you're removing things from it. There are a couple of different tools you can use for this, but there's a very simple to use tool that's meant for specifically for Kotlin, which is the Kotlin binary compatibility validator. You can add this as a dependency uh, like uh, this. It's a simple Gradle plugin. So uh, this is all it takes to add it to, to your project. And then you can do some additional configuration uh, in the API validation block like this. Um, you can set up packages that the validator should ignore. For example, if you have generated code from Android view binding, um, I'm showing the actual uh, configuration in the stream chat SDK here. Um, if you have generated code from Android view binding, you can ignore those packages of code. If you have projects where you're not storing production library code, you're storing samples or test code or documentation or something like that, you can ignore those as well. And uh, you can also tell the API about your opt-in annotations. So if you're using annotations that you use to mark API that's not supposed to be considered public, you can also put in those into the config, which is a really nice tie in with previous features. Then the plugin gives you two tasks that you can use. One of them is the API dump task, which will go through your module, compile it, and dump all of its API into text files like this, uh, .api files within the module. Um, here, you're going to see all of your classes and interfaces listed, as well as all of the declarations inside it, both uh, in the source and generated. Again, this is a binary validator. So for example, the second declaration here is a data class. So you're gonna see the copy method equals hash code to string the component methods and so on. You're supposed to put this into version control. So you generate it once when you add the plugin that gives you a, a snapshot of your current binary public API. And then as you're making changes to your library, you have a separate task called API check that you can run. Uh, this task uh, reruns the, uh, the API dump generation in the background. So it figures out what your new API would be with whatever changes you've made uh, in your library. And it compares it to the files that you have saved in your repository. And if it finds any differences, the task is going to fail and report the changes. So in this case, uh, here's a failure of this task where it's showing me as a simple diff that compared to what I had before in my uh, files in the repository, I've managed to change the copy method and remove this component two method. So it warns me that I've made changes to my public API. Uh, for in this example, what I've done is I took a property from the, um, from the header of my, uh, from the primary constructor of my data class and I've moved it into the body of the class, which is making these API changes behind the scenes. And as the error message is telling me, if I've done this intentionally, I can just rerun the API dump task, which will uh, update the API descriptors that I have stored in my repository. I can add those to a commit. And uh, that way, uh, if someone's reviewing my commit where I'm making the code changes or reviewing the PR that I've submitted, 
they'll also see all of the changes in the API files. So they can easily check if I've changed anything in the public API. So uh, this is a great way you can do this in commit hooks. You can do this in um, CI checks. Uh, it's a great way to not ever accidentally change your public API. All right, uh, that's it. Uh, I want to point you to some resources here. Uh, I'll have a better link for this on the next slide, uh, but I just wanted to highlight some of them. Uh, so first of all, this talk is also available as an article. If you want to share that around, maybe it's easier to share. Uh, you can find that on my blog. Uh, then there's the article about maintaining compatibility that I mentioned a couple of times. Uh, I also gave a talk last week about building uh, great Android libraries. So you can go to my talks pages on my site to check out the recording of that. That was a Droid webinar last week. And just for general advice, I think it's a really good idea to go through Effective Java and Effective Kotlin at least once. Uh, both of those books have really valuable things in them. Um, even all of the effective Java, well, almost all of the effective Java uh, still applies when you're writing Kotlin code. So uh, if you want to grab the slides or those resources or even more resources like the validator tools and links to the opt-in annotations and all of that, uh, you can find this talk on the talks page of my website. And if you want to follow me for Android and Kotlin stuff and um, while well, talking about the stream chat SDK a lot, uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, you can also reach me there if you have any questions left over that I somehow not, um, that I don't answer uh, during this uh, session. So to recap really quickly, a minimal API is a very good idea. You have the internal visibility modifier to use to hide things within the library. Explicit API mode is great to control and think about uh, your visibilities and not accidentally make things public. Published API is handy when you're working with inline methods. And opt-in APIs are a great tool for a large variety of things. Um, they let you um, make things, mark things as internal that are otherwise public for your own like internal library use. You can use it to mark experimental and uh, opt-in APIs and so on. Uh, that's it. Uh, let's go to the chat and see if we have any questions. Yeah, thank you, definitely. So we have one question so far from Yogev. And uh, he asks, can you make a whole module opt-in? And this was around the time with uh, opt-in annotations. Uh, yeah, uh, you can do that. Let me go back to that slide real quick. Uh, so right here. Uh, so if you uh, want to opt in in the entire module, uh, you can add this kind of Gradle configuration uh, in that module, uh, which will tell the compiler that within this module, it's fine to use anything anywhere that's annotated with internal my library API and would otherwise uh, produce warnings or errors. Wait. All right. So I hope this clears up Yogov's question. Um, and it looks like so. Raspan just said that nice and clear, and thank you. So I I would second that. Really, really great talk. Thanks. Thanks for being on. And unless we have any questions left, or you want to say anything, but I stopped you doing from. I think I think that's all. Uh, yeah, if Perfect. anyone has questions later, uh, find me on Twitter, or find me over the Kotlin link Slack. Uh, it's not difficult exactly. to reach out. Yeah, this is this is always a great place to start to look for us uh, on on the Kotlin link Slack. And yeah, as always, some some uh, housekeeping things. So if you like the talk, leave this thumbs up. If you didn't like it, well, approach us and tell us why, and uh, press this subscribe button which should be somewhere, somewhere uh, here, and uh, you will get notified for, for the upcoming talks. So thanks all. And hang on, if I have a, a library that generates code, how can I manage visibility of generated code? Do you want to take this question on from uh, uh, Dali? Yeah, uh, that's a difficult ah. one. Um, so that's going to depend on the code generator that you're using. Uh, they have to support um, any options uh, that they might want to provide. So for example, if you're using Room, uh, you're going to unavoidably generate some public declarations uh, because it's generating Java code and it can't generate internal uh, things because it doesn't exist in Java. 
and for it to work, it can't generate private things either. Um, so with code generators, sometimes you just can't control the visibility, which is really annoying. Um, ideally, uh, code generators will move to Kotlin and wherever it makes sense, generate internal things. Uh, but as long as they're generating Java code, uh, you might not be able to do anything about it because a lot of the code will just have to be public because there's no other visibility available. All right, I hope Dali this helped. And this might be a nice discussion you could have uh, directly if you have a concrete question with the code generator you have. So maybe you come up with, with a good idea. So yeah, okay, thanks. So it looks like he got the answer he was looking for. Perfect. Great. Right, then I wish you all a great evening and a lovely weekend and see you all for next month's 